Peace and blessing family, it's your man Marifa and welcome to Bible study. Yes, that's right, Bible study. We have an esoteric Bible study where we get into the deeper meaning and all of the scriptures that we're going to be reading from the Bible, okay? Today we have us a great topic. We're going to discuss the fall of man from Genesis chapter 3, all right? Very controversial, very important part of the Bible and we're going to get into the deeper esoteric meaning from the esoteric perspective as opposed to theological perspective, all right? So we're going to put into this information the real history, science, as well as astrology, so you can understand the deeper meaning of these scriptures, all right, going forward. So with that being said, are you ready to begin? Let's go. All right, so as usual, we're going to be coming from the King James Bible, Bible Study Bible, the King James Version, all right? So King James study Bible, we're going to be reading from that. And we're going to get started with Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, because we have a lot to cover. All right. So now from chapter 3, Genesis, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? All right. Very important start introduction to chapter three. We're introduced to the serpent. Now, the serpent is a very unique creature in essence because it has ties and connections to ancient Egypt. All right. So when you look at the pharaoh headdress of ancient Egypt, you will notice two animals that are on the headdress. One is a snake or a serpent, cobra, and the other is a bird. Uh, vulture, right? So the snake is Wajet and the bird is Nekbet. Now they both symbolize two different things. The symbolism of the, 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 the snake is that of Kundalini energy rising to through your chakra system in your body, your energy field, and rising through your pineal gland, right? Your pineal gland is the seat of the soul where you're getting your intuition, your knowledge, your wisdom, and intellect from your subconscious, all right? All of that information is being recorded in your Akashic records. Now, the ancient Egyptian Africans understood this, and they venerated the, the snake from the pineal gland, put it right there on the top of the headdress, which is right here in the pineal gland, which is people call the third eye. Now, when you look at the, the brain, the structure of the brain from the anatomy, there's two hemispheres of the brain, upper and lower hemisphere, right? So the pineal gland sits in the upper hemisphere of the brain. And then the lower hemisphere of the brain was representation of the bird. All right, so the two animals on the headdress of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh had different symbology and different meanings, all right? The, the, the snake, was represent representation of the kundalini energy rising through to the pineal gland, getting your wisdom, intellect, and your, your knowledge and intuition and all of that good stuff from your pineal gland, right? It represented also the upper and lower hemisphere of the brain. The bird was representing the lower part of the brain, the snake, the upper part of the brain, because the pineal gland sits in the upper part of the brain, right? And it also represented upper and lower kinetic. All right, so the two lands. All right, so if you understand that history, you now know what we're looking at as far as the serpent being introduced in the Greek and the version, the Greek and Roman version of the Bible, right? So the serpent, the serpent was now introduced into it as the adversary of God. Okay, so once we go into the chap this 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 chapter, you'll see that the difference between the serpent and the God of this book, right? So the serpent is depicted as the adversary. Now you have to place yourself in true history and know that the authors of this book were the Greco-Romans and the English, right? The British English. Now all three of these are white Europeans, all right? White Europeans from Europe. These individuals were the enemies of the ancient Africans and the Africans, all right? They conquered their lands. So you got to understand real history and understand to be able to tie this back and to understand how this serpent was now introduced into this story and been created as 
the adversary to this God. Now, the author of this story, Francis Bacon, you remember we talked about in other videos, the French Mason, you know, who wrote this story, sanctioned by King James in England in 1611 AD, authored this story, all right, created this version and wrote this story. So the, 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 writing, the writing style of Francis Bacon is depicting this serpent, all right, as the adversary of this God they created in this story. And this God is actually someone symbolically, symbolically having to be white European, okay? So with that said, the adversary enemy of God is the serpent, which is related back to ancient Africa and the Pharaoh, Egypt, Egyptian Pharaohs. And the God of this version of this story is related to the Greeks and the Romans, okay? So we have uh, a villain that's being established, right, in the story. So now, the serpent asked the woman, uh, and he said unto the woman, Ye have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. First of all, God told Adam in, verse, in chapter 2 not to eat of the tree of the gardens, right? Didn't say anything to the woman. Right. That's not what the book says. Second of all, how did the, the serpent come to know this information, this knowledge of what God told Adam, the conversation that God told Adam? How did the serpent know this? So the serpent, you have to understand the representation of the serpent in the metaphor that is given you the symbology of the particular serpent as being cunning, wise, knowledgeable, uh, discerning. All of these aspects and attributes that the serpent has. All right. That's why they call them subtle, the most subtle of all the beasts. So when the ancient Egyptian Africans who venerated the serpent understood that this had to do with the pineal gland and your abilities to discern, have intuition, have wisdom and have knowledge that comes from your pineal gland, your third eye, then you can tie that back. And you can know as to why this has significance in this story and why the serpent is being introduced right here in verse one of chapter three. All right. So now they're establishing a villain. They're establishing an enemy. OK, of this God. So you have to understand that everything has duality, good and evil, right and wrong, left and right. You know, God eat and, and, and Satan. You know what I'm saying? So they're establishing an enemy. All right. So this is what they're doing. So second verse, chapter three, verse two. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. OK, so now stopping at verse three. Fear has been introduced by this God. So this God has given fear unto the man and to the woman, saying that you can eat of all the other trees, everything that you see around you, but that one in particular, don't eat of it or you're going to die. OK, so this God did not give them any knowledge, did not give them any, you know, information as to why, why they're in the garden. What's the purpose for them being there? Um, what's the knowledge of the place? You know, what what do these things do? You know, what what do the trees do and how do they grow fruit and what type of fruit is it? And how does it taste? And why can we not eat it? And then also this God put the man and the woman in the Garden of Eden, knowing that they shouldn't be there and did not prepare them to be in that position. They God of this Bible put them in a tempting environment to tempt them. OK, so some people say, oh, God is trying to test, you know, man to see what man would do. Right. But that's not free will. That's not free will. That is more or less uh, you're playing games. So God is playing a sick, twisted mind, mental game with man and woman. Placing fear in their hearts, letting them know, hey, you can go and, and do all of this stuff with these other trees. But that one particular tree, 
don't touch it. Knowing that those they're going to be curious. They're going to want to know why. They want to they want to know, you know, what is it about this tree? You know, why is it so special? Why is why is it different than the rest of these trees? What makes it so different? You know, these things that God did not place into the minds of Adam and his wife. He kept them ignorant. All right. So verse four. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. All right. So now if you're looking at it from historical perspective and the Gnostics, we're talking about the Gnostics who had leaned more on knowledge as opposed to faith and um you know, stuff when it comes to like belief and things of like nature. The Gnostics, they they wanted to know, you know, they wanted to know the truth. So they sought and they sought truth in everything. If you can't prove it to me, the Gnostics didn't believe it. All right. So they needed evidence. Right. So the Gnostics held this belief when they read this stuff. You know, they, they read this Greek and Roman story. The Gnostics was like very skeptic, you know, because they felt that the serpent was, you know, the the good character and the God of this book is the evil character, you know, because the serpent pretty much gave the, the, uh, the woman courage and gave her the knowledge, you know, Hey, you won't die. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. There ain't nothing harmful about that tree. God knows that once you eat it, you're going to become knowledgeable. Your, your pineal gland is going to be opening. You'll be able to activate, you know, your third eye and stuff like that. And you'll be able to know, you know, the difference between good and evil. You'll know right from wrong. You'll know all of this stuff. You have some wisdom. You have intuition. You have discernment. You have knowledge. OK, so the serpent told him that God didn't give him that information. God just put him in the garden and gave him no commandments. You know, you can do this, but you can't do that. You better do this and you better not do that. Just commandments. God didn't give them no knowledge, no information, nothing. All right. It's just like putting your kids in a situation and then telling them, you know, figure it out. You know, better not do this. When I come back, this better not be done. You know what I'm saying? So you're going to put the kid in a situation where they know, where you know the kid is going to be curious, trying to find out what's going on with this. But at the same time, you're not willing to give that kid the knowledge that they need to understand why, to understand what, to understand how. You see what I'm saying? So the serpent is more of a good character than this God that's in this, this story. Right. Verse six. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, the woman in this essence in verse six, she had the courage. She had the courage to be able to go out and not be afraid. She didn't buy into the fear factor that this God had gave him like, oh, if you eat from this tree, you're going to surely die. She actually listened to wisdom. She actually, you know, had some courage and looked at the perspective from the serpent and said, you know what? I've been thinking about that tree all this time. And I've been curious as to know what is so special about that tree. And I've been trying to figure out. And now you gave me this knowledge. And the fear is gone. I'm no longer afraid of what this you know, boogeyman or spookism that, you know, that, that this God has given unto the man and told my husband, right? So he's, the husband is still there. He just, he just being a punk ass. You know what I'm saying? He just punked out. He's standing right there. He didn't say nothing. He was quiet the whole time. Didn't say not one word. Let the woman go ahead and talk to the, the serpent and the serpent and the woman had a conversation. He's standing there the whole time, right? He's standing there, the man, Adam, <laughs> standing there the whole time. 
This ain't not one word. But she had the courage to say she took the knowledge and applied it, said, I'm no longer afraid because I have the knowledge. I'm no longer in fear in my mind because I'm free now. And then she ate of the fruit. She seen that it was good for, you know, pleasant to the eye and, and the tree is desirous and it made one wise. She like, OK, those are all good qualities and traits that I need to be able to do what I need to do in this life and move forward in my purpose. So I'm going to use that to my advantage and I'm going to take advantage of it, take this opportunity to eat this fruit. Boom. She ate it. It's like nothing happened. I didn't die. So here, husband, you can have some too. stop being a punk. <laughs> you ain't gonna die here the serpent said it you ain't gonna die and guess what we didn't die right so right there right so verse 7 and the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons now the knowledge is there they finally got discernment their eyes are open and they realize that they were naked. They're exposed, right? They realize that they are in an environment in Africa where they shouldn't be. They shouldn't belong. They don't belong there. This, But this God, this author, now you got to come outside of this, what you see in the text, right? You got to come outside of this to put this in this proper perspective. Now, the author is a white European male, right? This white European male Francis Bacon is writing it from his perspective. OK, so he's looking at it and he's saying to himself that, you know, they're naked, they're exposed. And we already established in the story that the Garden of Eden is in Africa. Right. We established that in the second video, you know, chapter two, the Garden of Eden is in Africa and Adam and Eve or whoever, you know, her name is wife are in this garden that this God has placed them in. The, the, the garden is, is plentiful, has fruits and, and trees and all type of animals and, you know, everything growing in abundance and fresh water and all type of beautiful and abundant stuff. Now they're naked. They know now that they're naked. They're not just blissfully ignorant anymore. So they know they don't belong there. Now they're trying to create things to help cover them up to fit in to blend in they get they put an apron on <laughs> you know try to sew them stuff to, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons you know how did they sew something you know they got a needle and thread back then <laughs> they should have said they tied it together and put it on but they said they sewed it <laughs> anyway so one to verse eight and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? First of all, let's go back. Lord God walking. <laughs> in the garden, in the cooler of the day. Now, this is supposed to be a God, right? Now, where do we get the concept of a God? Now, God is walking in this verse, right? Verse eight, that indicates that God has two legs, two feet, right? Like a man, just like a man or a woman, no different, right? So the author of this story came up with the idea and concept of a God, right? And depicted this description or image of this God, and it has legs to walk. You need legs to walk, right? So where did the author of this story, Francis Bacon, get the concept of a human God figure from ancient Egypt? You go to Egypt today, you'll see all over the reliefs carved in stone in the walls, <laughs> all of the gods, right, in human form. They have zoomorphic, anthropomorphic styles of uh, imagery for the gods. 
of ancient Egypt and it's all over the walls. All of the gods are in human form. Body of a man, maybe the head of, you know, whatever, you know, zoomorphic type figure it is, be it a ram, be it <laughs> uh, a crocodile, be it, you know, uh, a scarab beetle, you know, but a body of a man. So the concept of having a god look like a man came from Africans, came from Africans. All right. So the, the French slash English author Francis Bacon, when he wrote this Bible in 1611 A.D., sanctioned by King James of England to make him create this, this Bible for him, the author stole the concepts and ideas of a God looking like a man from ancient Egypt. Okay? That's why God is walking <laughs> in verse 8 in the garden. Not hovering over the waters of the deep. None of that. <laughs> Just walking like a man. All right? So, second thing. That's one thing. Second thing. God, you know, they said they hid themselves from the presence of God, right? And God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? This is supposed to be God, right? This is supposed to be the almighty God, the all-knowing God. Why doesn't God know where Adam is? He's in the garden. Why does he not know where Adam is in the garden, right? How does he not know that? How is he the all-knowing God, all-seeing and all of this, that, and the third, right? He's everywhere, right? They say God is omnis omnipotent, omnipotent, omniscient. <laughs> That's what the church said. Yeah. How did he not know? How did God not know? Right? Verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. This is Adam telling God. And God said, who told thee you was naked, right? <laughs> Who told you that you was naked? And how did you, has thou eaten <laughs> of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat us? So he's telling them, hey man, who told you that you was, <laughs> you was naked? And did you eat from that tree that I told you? <laughs> how did all knowing God not know? <laughs> First of all, how did all knowing God not know who told him that he was naked? And first and second of all, how did he not know that he didn't eat from that tree? Come on, man. That's just common sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's common sense. So how did he not know? Right. So then he said in verse 12, and the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. So here's Adam shifting the blame. You know what I'm saying? He over there pointing for it's her. She the one, God. She the one. You know, he pointing this finger over here, but he forgetting the thumb <laughs> pointing back at him. You know what I'm saying? He forgetting the thumb that's pointing back at him. It's her over there. She the one. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he's shifting the narrative or he's shifting the blame onto the woman, right? So then the woman comes back in verse 13 and she said, and the Lord God said unto the woman, was it, what is this that thou has done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. So she's shifting the blame too. She don't want to take no responsibility for nothing. So the man don't want to take responsibility and the woman don't want to take responsibility. So it's like, you know how you have your kids, <laughs> your kids and stuff like that. They they do something wrong or bad and you walk into the room and all of a sudden they'll be like, ooh. <laughs> and you'll be like, what happened? Something is broke or something like that. Something they broke something. You're like, man, what happened? Who, who broke who broke this? Who, <laughs> who broke that? And you try to figure out who did what. And nobody want to confess. Nobody want to say it was, yeah, I did it. You know what I'm saying? None of that. <laughs> everybody pointed the finger. Hey me, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know what I'm saying? All of that. <laughs> it's the same thing. So I'm like, man, I swear. So nobody wants to take responsibility, right? And be accountable, right? So here it is. So then um, 
They put it on the serpent. The woman put it on the serpent. Right. So and the Lord God said in verse 14 unto the serpent, because thou has done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, here, in essence, we're looking at it from the serpent being converted to a snake. Right. From the beginning, we're talking. We didn't know if the serpent had legs or whatever to that effect. But we're assuming that it is because God cursed it to be on its belly now. So it changed the form of the serpent. So the serpent can come in different forms. You know, it could be a lizard or something like that. Some whatever, you know, form of reptilian from the reptilian family. Right. Which is snakes is a part of. But it changed the form of the of the uh, the, the animal. Right. And then it says in verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, this is a very powerful verse. It's talking about the, the Kundalini energy, right? That rises into the pineal gland and it gives your intuition, your you know knowledge base and your you know discernment. Your wisdom and all of this, that and the third. Now, one of the negative aspects that people put or connotations that people put on women is that they're too emotional. Right. They always get attitudes for no reason. And, you know, it's always a bad attitude just for no reason because of emotion. Now, that comes from estrogen. The estrogen that is secreted in the brain causes women to become emotional. And women have more estrogen estrogen than men. Men secrete more testosterone. Right. Which is less estrogen which is causing them to be less emotional. So from this perspective, a lot of people will say that women have difficult times making decisions because, you know, they get too emotional. But from that perspective, that is a negative connotation or negative uh, label that they put on women, which is a lie. It's a myth. You know what I'm saying? So you can't paint a brush, a broad brush on every woman and say, well, they're not able or capable of making a decision uh, because of their emotions. So this is the talking about putting the enmity, the enmity between thee and the woman, the serpent energy from the that comes into the pineal gland causes you to have discernment and the ability to think and rationalize and things of that nature and gives you the wisdom to make decisions and choices and stuff like that. That enmity they are talking about here in this book that is always been a part of women and females. OK, they've always been emotional. You know, because of the estrogen that is secreted in the female and feminine energies. All right. So from that perspective, he's trying to say, because the woman had eaten this fruit, this is the reason why she's emotional. This is the reason why, you know, so they put in the blame on some fictional mythological story that created by this white man, this white European <laughs> And they're trying to blame it on that as opposed to scientifically saying because of science, you know, the estrogen that is secreted causes these, you know, these liquids in order to form in the brain and secrete in the brain to cause these emotional, you know, things. But it doesn't affect your rational, your rationalization or your ability to make a decision or choice. All right. It just gives you a little bit of emotion. You know, you feel a little bit more, you know, that's why women have more empathy than men. All right. So in that perspective, this is what the author is trying to, you know, write off and say women are too emotional, you know, and it's going to be enmity between the snake, the serpent and the woman, which is the Kundalini energy going to the pineal gland. And she won't have the ability to make a decision, a choice because she's too emotional. Right. All right. So verse 16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. One more time. Verse 16, chapter 3, Genesis. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be 
to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, let me explain something. In history, in Africa, the Africans had a matrilineal society. Matrilineal means the man and the woman are on even field. Okay? No choice or decision is made without both consulting the other. And every decision and choice is coming from the two as one. The two shall become one. Right? And it, they were governed that way. Their families were structured that way. The woman was is just as important or more than the man. Okay? Now, comes along, here comes the white European in 332 BCE under Alexander the Greek and his generals, which was Ptolemy Soter, which was the ruler of Egypt after Alexander died. They have a patrilineal mindset. Patrilineal means the man is above the woman. The woman is always a servant to the man. So she's subservient underneath the man. This is where the man is here and the woman will be here. She will always be underneath the man and he will always have rulership over her. So she will have to be submissive, a servant, a slave to the man. OK, and once we go through this whole Bible, you will see how that whole theme of patrilineal mindset plays out. All right. But this is very important. You know, for many centuries and years, women have been fighting the rights through women's lives, you know, feminist groups trying to have equal footing and bearing with the man in government, jobs, society, status, you know, all type of stuff. So here's the white European concept of that structure, patrilineal, in verse 16 of chapter 3 of Genesis. The woman will always be a ruled by a man, according to the white European system. So they take this concept, they put it in their Bible, this Bible that we're reading right here, they put it in this Bible. They preach it to you every Sunday. They indoctrinate you every Sunday in the church. You know, women, be submissive to your husbands. Women, be quiet in church. Women, don't speak. Ask your husband at home. Men, be be, be rulers and leaders of your, your family and this, that, and the third. They pound in this concept in your head. Then they go to government. The president has always been a man. There's never been a female president in the history of the United States. Never. It's always been a male. You know what I'm saying? A white male until Barack Obama. And some people may even say him. <laughs> but anyway, but a male. Right. Never been as far as like the. Well, now they're, they're slowly but surely in business, creating more opportunities for women in higher positions. Right. Managerial positions in in uh, business, but for centuries, you know, in the household, the, it's the the man. When you get married, the woman usually takes the the last name of the man, and she gets rid of her maiden name from her father and mother. So the woman is always subservient or submissive to the man, according to this scripture. Chapter three, verse 16. This is where we get this concept and idea. And this was created by a white European written. So we're following this white European ideology that we're indoctrinating and everyone has accepted and embraced this concept. And they have just gone on with it. You know, for very many centuries, when women are born into this world, they believe that they can't achieve certain things, they can't achieve certain things because the white male, male structure in place because of this verse and this scripture is going to always keep them here. Always. And that's how we, you know, go through society. We say, oh, because the man is stronger <laughs> physically than the woman. You know, this, that, and the third. 
that's what the the excuse is and uh, to go along with this 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 created story from the white european in this verse chapter 16 i mean chapter 3 verse 16 of genesis all right so anyway enough preaching about that moving on verse 17 and unto adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which i commanded thee saying thou shalt not eat of this it cursed is the ground for thy sake in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life so wait a minute <laughs> so the woman she gets you know her emotions and all of this stuff is rattled you know her kundalini can't be balanced and everything like that then she get you know pains and child rearing and and childbirth then she gets you know punished for uh she had to be underneath the man <laughs> You know what I'm saying? She getting all of this punishment because she was courageous and she stepped out of that uh, fear that God had put into, you know, the man. You know what I'm saying? And the serpent, you know, he get, you know, put on his belly. Now you got to crawl on the belly. All of this punishment, right? But the man who, who ate from the fruit too, he ate from the fruit too. You know what I'm saying? He did exactly what the what the woman did. He don't get nothing done to him. Nothing. God said, you know what? <laughs> I, you know what? Because you ate of that fruit, I'm going to curse the ground. <laughs> I'm going to curse. You know what? The ground, the earth is like. What would I do? <laughs> that, that, that's just like giving a child a whooping who didn't do nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The child, the child, look, was just around. The child was just standing around in the area and, and somebody did something wrong and the parents come in and find out something ain't happening right and then he's like, what's going on? And, he, and the child that's innocent get a whooping too because he was just in company with somebody. <laughs> that's how the earth is like. The earth is like, wait a minute, man, I didn't do nothing. <laughs> Why am I get? So the earth is cursed because of the man, <laughs> but the, nothing happened to the man, right? You got to think about the, the, the writer of this book, the writer of this story, Francis Bacon, like I told you, they're going to cover the man, the white European. These characters that they're depicting in this story are white European. The Adam, <laughs> Eve, are they are white European characters. They're not, you know, black characters. I'm going to show you the black characters when we get further along into Genesis. <laughs> I'm going to show you who the black characters were and how they were treated. But these characters right here are written, they are white Europeans. So they're going to get the benefit of the doubt. They're going to give the man who's the head of everything, the white man, the benefit of the doubt. And... They're going to get away with all type of stuff. OK, so they're setting the precedence right here. The white man doesn't have the same punishment as the woman doesn't have the same punishment as the serpent, even though he did the exact same thing that they did. He ate of the fruit. Think about it. Think about it. So anyway, <laughs> going forward. It says in verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to eat, I mean to thee, and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, that till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, so we're saying, you know, the ashes to ashes, dust to dust thing that always, you know, they said funerals and this, that, and the third, whatever. I told you in the last video about the cosmic dust and how the atoms were formed and created from the molecules to be able to create flesh. I already broke that down. Go watch that video and find out about that. But from this perspective, they're saying the land will be barren. The land will not be as, as plentiful and full, okay, as the Garden of Eden. We already established that the Garden of Eden is located in Africa. And everything grows in abundance in Africa because the sun is present in Africa at all times. There is no winter in Africa. 
when you're always constantly <laughs> having the source of the sun, which is the source of our creation, then you're going to get everything plentiful. Food, water, uh, seed, you know, animals are going to be grown, born and grown and everything like that. The land is, 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 pl is plentiful in the land. When you go to these places that have colder regions and they have, you know, wintertime and stuff like that, nothing is growing. Nothing grows in the wintertime. Everything is dormant. You know what I'm saying? Waiting for the spring to come and, and the sun to come back out to be able to replenish the earth. Right. So God is preparing Adam in the story for what he about to do next. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. So. Verse 20. And God called his wife name Eve because she was the mother of all living very important now when you look up the definition of the word Eve in Webster's dictionary it says before so that means that Eve is the woman and it says that she was the mother of all living that means that she came before Adam you understand that the woman came before Adam. So if you go back and you understand science and you understand real history and you know that women were more prevalent on this earth way before the pre-dynastic pre period, you know, of ancient Africa and Egypt, somewhere around 10,000 to a million some years ago, there were more, there were nothing but women on the planet. All right. So they had a process in which they can reproduce or produce, you know, create you know, life without having to have a male to do that with. There's uh, a process. I can't remember the name at the time, but there's a process then. And there's, you know, uh, reptiles that are still able to perform this at this time on this planet. But at one point, women had that capability and they gave it up. You know, once they started splitting the, the chromosome, the mutation occurred and they started splitting the chromosome into XY to making the male. So the women gave that up. You know, it's almost like speaking Spanish, a foreign language. If you don't use it every day, you're going to lose it. Right. So she lost that capability of reproducing without a male. But the female had that capability and she came before the man. All right. So you have to understand that real true history and that science in order for you to understand this verse, chapter 20. And you have to understand what Eve stands for. Eve means before. That means she came before the man. All right. Before Adams and all of that stuff like that, when they were formed, the molecular structure of Adams was not a male. It was a female. Everyone is born in this planet starts out as a female. All right. When you go through a pregnancy, they have to wait to reveal the gender. You know, when the doctor goes in and does the ultrasound on the belly of the, the, of the mother and, you know, they find out if it's a male, a boy or a girl on the, uh, you know, from the ultrasound, they have to wait a certain period of the pregnancy in order for them to find out what that gender is going to be. Because during pregnancy, everyone starts out with two X chromosome. Everyone. OK. There's a stage or period of time during pregnancy where the chromosomes will either split into XY or it will stay the same XX and you stay a female. Right. So during that time frame, everybody will remain will start out as a female XX. OK, so Eve came before male came before man and she is the mother of all living. All right. So understand that esoteric, deeper meaning. All right. Now, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Very important. Coats of skin. So when they were revealed and, and had their eyes open, they understood, understood that they were different. They were uh, aware now that they were different than you know, everybody else in the garden and stuff like that. So thinking of the concept of the authorship, going back to real history, Eden is in Africa. So understanding the metaphor here, 
of the symbology of this concept and idea. These two white Europeans are in Africa in the Garden of Eden, where it's pleasure and beautiful like heaven. You know, everything is in abundance. And then they were just ignorantly, blissfully there <laughs> until they made they were made aware that they didn't belong there. They the knowledge of good and evil came from and gave them discernment, gave them with the pineal gland and their eyes were open. And now they were embarrassed. They were found to be naked. They made aprons, you know, to cover themselves, trying to fit in with everybody else. Think about the, the concepts and the, the symbology and the metaphors that are happening here when they say that God made coats of skin and clothed them. OK, understanding white Europeans, they don't have melanin in their skin. Now, some will say the original sin is really being born without melanin. That's the original sin. That's the real original sin. You don't have no melanin in your, your, your blood and your skin, brother. The melanin is a natural sun protectant. OK, my dark, beautiful skin right here. <laughs> I'm protected from the sun. I can go out in the sun and the only thing that's going to happen to me, I'm going to get a little darker. I could be out in the sun all day long. The only thing that's going to happen to me, I'm get a, I'm going to get a little darker. All right. Because the melanin that's inside of my body, my skin, it secretes this dark liquid that covers my organs and it rises to the top of my skin. It makes me a little bit darker the more I'm exposed to the sun. So my skin absorbs the sun. OK, whereas white Europeans, they are melanin deficient. They don't have any melanin. They are albino. They are albino. They have oculine utaneus. OCA uh, one, two, three or four. Go and look that up. Google it. Oculine utaneus. OCA one, two, three or four. Google that and research that. And you'll see it's albinism. That's who are the descendants of the white people. OK. White people come from albinos. That's a mutation that occurred. All right. In human life, in real life, there was a mutation. So albinos don't have <laughs> melanin. So when they sing that God made coats of skin in verse 21 and clothed them, they're referring to them having this different type of skin. This, you know, skin that did not, you know, have any melanin in it. The original sin. All right. Didn't have no melanin. They're not a part of the sun. They're not children of the sun. Africans are children of the sun. That's why Africans venerated the sun so much, because it was a great source of power, you know, and we were ha we had the ability to be in it, <laughs> to live around it. Whereas al albinos cannot, they can't, they cannot survive in the sun as, as long. If white Europeans go out on the beach and they lay out on the beach, what's going to happen to them if they stay out there too long in that sun? They're going to start turning red, blood beat red because all of the blood is rising to the top of their skin. They don't have a, a, a dark liquid, you know, melanin to protect their organs the internal organs from the sun rays, their blood will boil up. If they stay in the sun way too long, they'll start getting blood boils and all of that stuff like that. And their skin will bubble up and, and you know, boils be on their skin and all this, that and the third. But that's what happened to them. Right. So this metaphor, this allegory, you know, story is trying to tell you something. It's trying to tell you that they are different than those in Africa. All right. So it's saying that, OK, the coats of skin and clothe them. God made coats of skin, gave them their, you know, <laughs> albino bodies and things of that nature. So this is what they, they had. So in verse 22, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So very important. I'm going to go ahead and let me go ahead and finish this out. This is the last verse. 
24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. And that's the end of chapter three. But we're going to talk about this because these last three verses, 22 through 24, are extremely important. Extremely important. First of all, you notice there he said, God said, behold, the man has become as one of us. Who is us? If this God was supposed to be a singular God, one single God, who is us they're referring to? A lot of Christians will try to tell you, oh, that's Jesus. You talking about Jesus. Jesus was in the Garden of Eden with him and stuff like that because they get that from John chapter one. You know, it said in the beginning was a word and God was with God and all this, that and the third and the word was with God. Woo, 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 woo. Right. We'll talk about that in another day and time. But when he said it become like us. Now, remember, in ancient Egypt, in Africa, they they practice in spirituality. Their practice was polytheism, which is multiple gods. OK, not just monotheism. That was Akhenaten. Akhenaten in the 18th dynastic period in around 1325 BCE, he was the only pharaoh king on the throne to change the religious spirituality from polytheism, the worship of many gods, to monotheism in the worship of one God, which he called Aten, okay, which is the sun. But in this perspective, he's looking at it from saying, okay, the author knew that ancient Africans had a worship of polytheism of many, many gods, and they were trying to incorporate that because then the Greeks had also adopted the ancient African concepts of many gods. And then the Romans also took that concept and carried it on and worship many gods as well. So the worship polytheism of many gods was around for many centuries before this monotheism had come out. All right. So Akhenaten was the creator of monotheism. Akhenaten was. So they they took the concept from ancient Africa and put it in their book. Right. So now also in that same verse, 22 is very important. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life. What is the tree of life? We've been talking about the tree of good and evil up until this point. Now we're being introduced into the tree of life. Tree of life is extremely important. The tree of life is what we should be striving for. The tree of life is what we should be looking to obtain. The tree of life is your knowledge and understanding and rising to a higher consciousness of being and connecting one with the real true consciousness of God. That's the tree of life. And your energy will eternally be within the presence of God. Eternally. That is the tree of life. To understand that you have this knowledge and this understanding of the aspects and natures of God, knowing all things of God, where you have good and evil, but now being in the presence of God because your energy will be one with God, an aspect of God, that is the tree of life. That's what we should be striving to be obtaining while we're here on this planet. Everyone is born with a purpose. When you come into this world, you're supposed to learn something and grow from that. You're supposed to grow from understanding. You go through these good and evil phases of your life, right? You have good and evil experiences. And from those experiences, you're supposed to grow and learn something that is part of your purpose. Now, your purpose is to grow and understand the many aspects of God. God knows all things. God is an energy, an energetic spirit. OK, it's not this figure that they have <laughs> in this Bible. I'm going to go into that in a different video. I've already done that video. Go and check out the African spirituality video that I've done under Marifa Asar, LLC, and you'll find, right? African spirituality, you'll see what the God is, uh, God truly is. But in this version of the story, the tree of life is very important because it gives you, you know, everything that we're looking for and we're seeking. But seemingly, you know, we were put out. According to this story, man and woman was put out from the presence of the tree of life to be able to, you know, stay away from it. 
and God sent them out <laughs> from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. And God put them in another area, you know, some other barren land that did not bear, you know, good fruits and all of this, that, and the third, right? So he drove the man out. That's what the Bible says. And he placed at the east of Garden of Eden cherubims, you know, which are guards, these angels and stuff like that. And the flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So they're protecting the tree of life. They got guards <laughs> and they have, you know, the, the flaming sword to protect it. And they, they kicked them, the Adam out, you know, knowing that he wasn't, you know, a part of this region in Africa. He shouldn't have been there in the first place. God lied or God didn't lie to him. God just kept information and kept knowledge from him. But the serpent was, you know, was being friendly. Hey, look, man, you are not going to die. And guess what? They didn't die. They ate the fruit and they did not die. So God did lie to them. <laughs> God did lie to them. God was trying to put that fear in their hearts. Fear. Wanted them to be afraid. Not living in knowledge and understanding. Once they got the knowledge, they were no longer afraid. That's what you're supposed to be striving for. And you're supposed to have a knowledge and understanding of all these things to be able for you to be able to connect with God, the consciousness and spirituality of the almighty God, the most high. And you're supposed to have this experience on this planet, in earth, with other people who have different personalities, <laughs> who have, you know, different things that they're doing on this planet to learn. And all of these experiences you're supposed to have, you're supposed to gain an understanding and a knowledge of God. And you're supposed to grow from that. Okay? You're growing in spirituality with the tree of life. And this, this book right here, this story did not want you to get to that point. This story in this book, in this Bible, was trying to keep you away from the tree of life. And they gave you something else. This Jesus character that the Romans created to distract you from the tree of life, to keep you away from your purpose, from you seeking your purpose. They keep you distracted with entertainment, sports, movies, <laughs> reality TV, school, work, <laughs> all type of stuff in order to keep your mind from focusing on your purpose, which is to find out about the tree of life. What is your purpose? What are you meant to do in this world? You see what I'm saying? It's a very deeper esoteric meaning. It's deeper than what you see on the surface. And Theologians and, you know, and religions and churches and all this stuff, they know they've been distracting you for centuries, keeping your mind off of your true purpose on this earth, keeping you under submission, keeping you timid and afraid, <laughs> giving you commands. You better not do this. You better not do that. You better live your life this way. That's religion. It's restrictive. You better live your life this way. You better live your life that way or else you're going to hell. <laughs> or else you're going to die. <laughs> and then the serpent came along and was like, nope, you're not going to die. <laughs> and, they, and they did not die. They did not die. They died later, <laughs> but not right then and there. But um, yeah, so like I said, that's chapter three, Genesis all right, a lot of stuff going on in that chapter. Chapter three had a lot, and it had a lot to do with what we do to this day. The way society is ran to this day has a lot to do with chapter three of Genesis. A lot of religions were formed, a lot of, you know, governments were formed, you know, um, the way we, you know, function as families, you know, the patrilineal 
system as opposed to matrilineal system was created from Genesis chapter three. You know, the, the punishment of the woman and how, you know, society has, you know, pretty much marginalized her and put her in a position of subservitude, you know, and it's just a lot of mess. And this all came from the mindset of a white European man. A white European male. And this is the mindset of the white European male. And this is how they've been perpetuating and been operating ever since 332 BCE when Alexander the Greek, not the great, he's a Greek, came and changed the whole world the way we operate right now. The Africans, we were peaceful, loving. We, we had equal bearing with our women. <laughs> you go back to Egypt, you'll see. The man and the woman are together. You know what I'm saying? Together. Equal. The Holy Trinity was father, mother, child. The Greek, the, the white European male, they came along. Now it's <laughs> father, son, and Holy Ghost. Where does the woman come from? Everybody is born on this planet through a woman. So why is the woman marginalized? I don't understand it. But anyway, uh, listen. <laughs> I'm going to end this right here and we'll pick back up uh, in our next video in chapter four. All right. So this has been another Marifa moment where knowledge has been reborn. All right. So learn more at Marifa Sar LLC as you see it right here on this banner. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. Marifa Sar LLC might be backwards, but learn more at Marifa Sar LLC. All right. So remember, this has been a Marifa moment where knowledge has been reborn. And remember, the more you know, the more you'll grow and the better off we all shall be. So I'll say until next time, love and light. Peace.